Before brand new backpackers set out on their first trip, it's a pretty fair assumption they will buy hiking and camping gear they've never had before. And in most cases, at least, they give some thought to cooking meals in the outdoors and how they're going to do it. And when they look at outdoor stoves and reviews of outdoor stoves, it's a safe bet that sooner or later, they're going to hear somebody talking about boiling water. I would bet that as soon as people started to put backpacking videos on YouTube, they started talking about boiling water. In late 2022, a few days before I recorded this, someone posted yet another YouTube video about boiling water with backpacking stoves. As a result, it's easy for the neophyte to conclude that they just have to boil water when backpacking. And maybe not just beginners. I saw people boiling water the first time I was on the Appalachian Trail, and I saw it the last time I was on the Appalachian Trail. For the record, what we're talking about is a full or a rolling boil, which requires a water temperature at sea level of 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. Some of the portable stoves that are acclaimed for boiling water weigh close to a pound and can cost up to $155 in late 2022. These stoves have a powerful lure for many because they seem to promise so much convenience. As I've said before, if we backpack one or two nights or don't hike very far, we can do all sorts of things that won't cause a problem. When it comes to gear, we can pretty much use whatever we want, no matter what it weighs, and boil water to our heart's content, with no harm done. But what if we want to go out for a week or two weeks? What if we want to hike 10 or 15 miles a day or more? What if it's our goal to cover hundreds of miles on a long-distance trail like the Appalachian Trail. I belong to this latter group. For me, heating water to a full boil is without question one of the most pointless things I could possibly do. As a result, I never boil water when backpacking. And I would emphasize it's my goal here to show what's possible and not to tell anybody what to do. One quick look at this chart helps explain why I don't boil water. Heating water is not an all-or-nothing proposition. There are temperatures well below boiling that will heat a freeze-dried meal just fine, and they will cook food in a pot just fine. You can easily double-check these temperatures for yourself, by the way. Put a pot of cold water on the stove at sea level, stick in a cooking thermometer, and watch how hot the water is when it starts to steam and bubble. It's my habit to heat water to this range of temperatures, I'd say I average about 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Make no mistake, water at these temperatures is hot with a capital H. Also, if we are 5,000 feet above sea level, the temperature of a full boil falls to 202 degrees Fahrenheit. Such elevations are rare in the eastern United States and much more common in the West. When backpacking, I lift the pot lid occasionally to check their water or food. And when I see that it's reached these temperatures, I turn the heat off. That does not mean, however, the cooking is finished. What I do next is simple. I just put the lid back on the pot and wait somewhere between 8 and 10 minutes, checking it occasionally. What I want to see looks like this. I have found that when the food looks done, usually it's done. And if I ever have any doubt, I'll take a bite to check. Is there any good reason why I don't bring food to a full boil? You bet there is. Whenever I have done it, one bad thing usually happens. Unless I'm boiling eggs or potatoes, there will be hardened, burned, or overcooked food on the bottom of the pot, both at home and on the trail, the kind that's a pain in the neck to clean out. I doubt I'm the only one with this experience. By comparison, overcooking on the bottom of the pot never happens to me with the heat and weight method. Anybody can test this kind of thing at home. I would encourage that. If good results are out of reach for whatever reason, there's always a full boil. I know that freeze-dried food instructions say to boil water. I've never done that either. Here's an old video still I shot in an Appalachian Trail shelter. That's a freeze-dried meal in the clear plastic bag. The white ring came with the meal so we could close the bag for the eight minutes needed for the food to cook. The package instructs us to wait eight minutes. 
That's about how long I waited with the meal at the shelter. And this is an old photo. Most freeze-dried meals I have seen since 2020 tell us to wait up to 15 minutes. Notice the thing that looks like aluminum foil. It's from a heavy aluminum foil cookie sheet. Here's another look. It's considerably thicker than normal aluminum foil. It will screen wind from a flame in anything but a gale force wind, and it can be folded and unfolded many times without tearing. I used the same one for a long time. At all the grocery stores near me, these cookie sheets sell for several dollars a pair, so we can keep one at home and bake cookies on it. This particular meal turned out just fine, and I heated the water to no more than 190 degrees with a dinky little Esbit stove which uses heating tablets for those who don't know. Another issue is that it takes more fuel to heat water to 212 degrees Fahrenheit compared to 180 or 190 degrees. Those canister stove demonstration videos run the stove full blast wide open when they time how long it will take to boil water. I've seen people on the AT run their stoves this way. Years ago, I saw people do it with white gas stoves, like this MSR. If we use the smallest fuel tank MSR makes, the combined weight is about a pound, not counting the fuel. By comparison, I rarely turn a canister stove flame up much higher than halfway. I admit that aside from the amount of fuel required, it's pretty harmless to really boil water for a freeze-dried meal. And freeze-dried meals are indeed fun, if we've never used them before. But I got tired of them. I got tired of their high price. I got tired of the fact that packaging is heavier than average. Remember, we have to carry out our own trash. So I started cooking in the pot. The white thing shown here is a nylon pot scraper. After I eat what I can with a spoon, I eat the rest with the pot scraper. After that, there's practically nothing left in the pot. I usually heat an ounce or two of water in the pot to rinse it clean. This takes very little time, and these pot scrapers are still for sale on Amazon in 2022. One might imagine freezing cold weather is the time when we really need to boil water. But if the temperature is above zero degrees Fahrenheit, I still cook the same way. Like I said, water at about 190 degrees Fahrenheit is very, very hot. With a lid on the pot, it hangs onto that heat for quite a while. Notice the blue thing under the stove in this photo. It's a piece of closed cell sleeping pad. Also notice the snow in the photo. The stove sits on the pad because the stove fuel is pressurized and I don't want it to get colder than I have to. That could lower the pressure. And when the stove is off and the pot has the lid on it for that weight, the pot sits on the blue pad. In these conditions, the food was hot enough when I ate it. Every time, even with snow on the ground. And more than once, I found the food was so hot, I had to add a little cold water to cool it down. Some folks make what is called a cozy, and that is an insulated container that holds the pot to prevent it from cooling too quickly. In my experience, there has been no need for such a thing. Another issue is weight. Like I said, those modern super-duper stoves that fasten a pot to the stove burner can weigh close to a pound. By comparison, my canister stove weighs 3 ounces without the canister, and my pot weighs 4 ounces. Plenty of people pay no attention to weight because they want to be, quote, comfortable. Like I said, on short trips, it's not a big deal. However, the average elevation change on the Appalachian Trail is 212 feet a mile. If we really want to cover distance there, a 15-mile day means we will climb uphill and walk downhill over 3,000 feet a day on average. In some areas, it's worse than that. And if we're going to go through that, it's the comfort of our feet and legs we should be worried about. Many people have had to hike on the thing before they understood this was true, including me. The stresses of such a pace, incidentally, are why some thru-hikers do things like going stoveless, sometimes eating candy and high-sugar foods at a volume that would make a nutritionist fall over in a dead faint. I've seen this myself, people doing things like scooping pieces of bread into a can of cake frosting. Others use cold soaking, soaking some kind of heat-and-eat food in a jar with cold water. 
I tried that myself as a test long before YouTube existed, and I thought the result was so nasty that a starving dog would think twice before eating it. Others, however, find it to be a great idea. Even so, we risk all sorts of unpleasant bacteria, such as salmonella and E. coli, unless we can keep such a jar absolutely clean. And now, once again, we're done. I'd like to thank all my longtime viewers who have stayed with me over the years. Take a look at my Twitter. The link is in the description. I use it to post news about the outdoors. And as always, thanks a million for watching.